Coming up on Tech News Today, did Google commit a crime? Is the iPhone 4 sub-retinal? Are you a jerk or is it the video games? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, June 9th, 2010. Tech News Today is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. And I am Becky Worley. Behind the board is our awesome producer, Eric Lanigan. Hey, guys. How you doing, Eric? Good. How are you? And this is the show where we kick around the tech news of the day, try to make it all make a little bit more sense. We're joined today by a special guest from ABC.com, Dan Patterson. How's, how you doing, Dan? Hey, I'm great. It's uh, nice to join you guys. I'm actually ABC News Radio. I think the the dot com guys might come down and smack me in the face. If I, I meant Good Morning America. I meant That's me. ABC. Right. No, I I meant CBS Evening News. No, oh, right. Our our silos are ubiquitous. Nice. So ABC News Radio. My apologies, Dan. Thanks for uh, joining us, though. I know Internet Week is happening in New York. We're going to talk about that a little later in the show. Uh, are you sober? I, I was, uh, you know, it takes an hour or two to sober up <laughs> is that, coffee. We'll, we'll find out from Dan if there is more than just partying going on at Internet Week. Monster There's schmooze that. fest. But first, Google has been accused of crimes. Uh, Google, according to Privacy International, almost certain to face prosecution for collecting data from the unsecured Wi-Fi networks when they were conducting their Street View project. Uh, Google released an independent audit of the rogue code, and PI is convinced... That the independent audit of the Google system shows that the system used for the Wi-Fi collection intentionally separated out unencrypted content of communications and systematically wrote this data to the hard drive. Well, auto systematically. I mean, that's how data gets written to a hard drive. I had a long conversation with Jill Hazelbaker, who's the um, head of Google's communications arm, and she told me what we've seen in print already. This was a mistake. And the, the point she kept coming back to was that they changed signals five times every second and that they were not pulling data, that this was really exclusively in their in the mind of the one lone engineer, she says, um, who did this. This was a, 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 a way to get IP addresses and work for their mobile platforms to help with geolocation. So it was innocent. Innocent. And the, I asked her, the guy who wrote the code still works there. Yeah. So he didn't get fired for this. No. Nope. How did it get onto the rig then? It was just somebody not paying attention? I mean, that's the hard thing is, is yeah. when you become the Titanic, there are a lot of stewards working at a lot of different levels. So let's just say that you buy the Google mea culpa. We did it. It's an accident. We didn't mean to. I can understand how that would happen. Um, that this, this, is, this could easily be a rogue act. And, and who knows how much code is on the rig? Privacy International says this is equivalent to placing a hard tap on a digital recorder onto a phone wire without consent or authorization. What, Dan, do you think that that's equivalent? I, I, as Becky said, it's very difficult to determine what criminal intent is. And having enough lawyer friends, I would never use that language if I didn't think there was criminal intent. So it, it depends on how and, and why... Whether this is systemic or whether this is somebody going rogue, but knowing only that language in the story here, I would take this very seriously. I yeah. think Privacy International's point is that, um, and this is quoting from them, some jurisdictions provide leeway for incidental or accidental interception, but where intent to intercept is established, a violation of law is created. So the fact that they, they intended to intercept and that they, they say, hey, we're just using this information for geolocation. Yeah. Does grabbing the IP address, is that the same thing? They unintentionally well, intended to do it. 
Well, and Becky, know. you hit on that. It, uh, you hit that on the head with the intent, and and intent is very difficult to prove. But man, you don't use language like that if you don't have the ability to prove that. Now, again, the European judicial system and and how precedent is set is very different. But uh, I I would never use language like that if I couldn't back that up. The Germans are almost certain to prosecute, uh, according to Simon Davies, head of PI. Uh, the UK has said it's reviewing the audit, but it doesn't have plans to pursue the matter. Uh, but it looks like Google will be dragged into court over an unintentional intentional collection. Uh, you know, it's no excuse to go up and say like, yeah, I mean, that software was designed to do that, but we didn't mean the software to be there. It was just a mistake. Sorry, we stole everyone's data. <laughs> Although part of me still thinks, you know, if it's unencrypted data and it's out in the public. Oh, I, that's the other thing. I mean, I completely agree. It's in some senses, it's, it's not the right thing to do. It definitely is a violation of sort of the wiretap clauses built in to, uh, what was that, 1986 law about wiretapping. But I mean, the, the, the other part of it is you're putting it out there. I mean, I did the story for GMA. We drove through my neighborhood. You would not believe the amount of networks that were completely under, unsecured. It's, it's, you know, instead of, it's not like the phone line because you can't accidentally unsecure your phone line. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a closed system. With Wi-Fi, it's totally open and it's like leaving your doors open. It doesn't make it right for someone to come in and steal your stuff just because your door is open, but you do bear a little bit of responsibility and, and it is a little different than leaving your door open because sometimes people leave their access points open on purpose in order to share. They just didn't encrypt their data. Right. But, uh, you know, in the end, that doesn't, that doesn't excuse anyone for stealing your data just because you didn't protect it, I guess. It's a mess. The courts will figure it out yeah. over there in the Europe. Meanwhile, there is more fun to be had in Internet Week in New York. So, so Dan, what, what the heck is this Internet Week and why don't we have it out here? <laughs> I, I think you have Internet Week every week. That's a good um, point. It's Christmas every day in the Silicon Valley. Gross. Um, Internet Week is, is a really interesting phenomenon. Uh, I had a, a, the opportunity to speak with uh, David Michelle Davies, the executive director of the Webby Awards yesterday, and uh, he's overseeing Internet Week. This is the third annual Internet Week, and it's grown by, by huge orders. Uh, last year, even though the city is more spread out, last year Internet Week, at least anecdotally, felt very similar to South by Southwest. And this year it, it feels, you know, my intent was to scale back and do less. And even by scaling back, doing less, I'm doing far more. Uh, as Becky said earlier, uh, it, it is a big schmooze fest. Uh, but New York City is this weird, very interesting haven, much like Austin is, of new young tech companies. And I think that this is, yeah, it's an opportunity to schmooze and go drink and party and that kind of thing. But we really are very proud of the tech companies that we've built here because our legacy is dissimilar than that of, uh, of the Valley. The Valley has a legacy and it has a history and it's not like New York doesn't. But typically, New York is the cocky town, and it's very accustomed to being, you know, the king of all media. In this case, uh, with tech, we we definitely take uh, uh, the back seat to Silicon Valley, and uh, I think that that has helped spur a lot of innovation. Um, one thing that uh, David said to me yesterday was that the city is very proud of being able to encourage uh, companies and people who are not risk adverse and. Because of that, we've we've had, you know, obviously Foursquare has come out of New York City and Dropio has come out of New York City. But we have a ton of small, very unique companies run by very young people. And we're starting to develop our own identity. I think, yes, New York Internet Week is uh, a, a an initiative by the city and there's a lot of funding that comes from the city. And it, it is one... I, I hear the word cynicism a lot when I go to uh, various parties. Like, ah, oh, it's a cynical Bloomberg effort to uh, to promote New York in a down economy. But I don't see it that way, and I never get a cynical vibe going to parties. See, I in think fact, that the interesting thing, though, when you say cynical, is that that, that is just the top level of the schmooziness. But yep. where this is yep. really, I think, coming to 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 into its own is when you look at the dollars. And um, one of the CEOs from a company that does uh, digital production um, he said, we're trying to help companies find a new way to spend all those brand dollars. And one of the things that New York has is all the advertising money. So this yep. is also a place where advertising money is coming together with new media and with web startups. And um, I think 
that is one of the interesting things that's happening. There are a lot of these sort of digital upfronts. Um, in the TV world, you have the upfronts where the networks show off all of their new content to the advertisers, and then the advertisers then go into discussions about how much advertising they're going to uh, put on these new shows. So now we see that in the digital format, um, there's a bunch of people who are Martha Stewart, Ariana Huffington, um, Lisa Kudrow's got a new show that she's pushing, and uh, even Paula Dean. did you see this? Uh, she has a new uh, internet uh, story, that uh, some sort of a, a series that she's doing. You got to listen to her talk about it. It's hilarious. She was talking to Sheer Lazar. Pretty funny. I well, I think, Becky, to so that end, um, we're also, we have a legacy of media, like you said, and I think that we are seeing some really cool mentorship programs and old school media people, you know, the, the ones we, we typically in web culture write off as being, ah, oh, it's, it's legacy media, what do they know? But I think we do see this really interesting blend, especially at parties and events. Yeah, we're going and drinking, but at the same time, we're going and connecting different generations of people to different types of ideas. And as much as traditional media can learn from the web, I think web people are really learning about packaging of media and content and creating really unique experiences here. Yeah, and I think it's um, old media who are finally getting it that they need to jump back in. So, Eric, do you have that clip? I do. Okay, great. Let's listen to Paula Dean. I'm so excited about it because I can really... Uh, I have the opportunity to interact with the people that watch my cooking show, unlike that ability, you know, if, if we're communicating through television. It's only a one-sided communication. So I have already enjoyed the fact that I could get on and respond to different people. Uh, it's like having a next-door neighbor times a hundred or a thousand. So great. She said y'all about 15 times in the interview and she's chewing a big wad of gum. But I mean, the point is she represents a big chunk of the population who's viewing. And we've also seen new numbers coming out about who's watching web video. Um, did you see that story, Tom? Yeah. A Wall Street Journal story today saying that uh, original web series are moving their viewership to the evenings. Blip TV, which distributes uh, thousands of independent online videos, says their peak time has moved from 12 to 3 p.m. to 8 to 11 p.m. And Revision 3, our friends over there, now say that uh, primetime views top lunchtime views by 20%. 62 million people are watching web video in primetime. And that's a big jump. And I think I was trying to, I, I tried to get in touch with uh, Nielsen to get the total number of people that are watching in primetime, but I couldn't get the total number, but just so a relative number, 62 million watching web video in primetime. American Idol, one sweeps with 24 million on its best show. So, um, you know, that's a, an interesting relative thing. Now, the other thing, um, American Idol, 30 second commercial spot, six hundred and forty two thousand dollars for 30 seconds during american idol so i think the point is money's going to be going out of regular tv this is old news but now we have some quantitative analysis of how it's going out of old tv into internet tv and you see organizations and and meetups like internet week where the money is starting to change hands well, and, and uh, you know, Blip TV celebrated their fifth anniversary last night. One of the things they've always said is, we are not YouTube. We are, we are HBO to YouTube. And that really illustrates the point that it's about the content. And of course, we've known this for a very long time, but often the web is discredited as being second tier, second class content. And I think that when we see that advertising dollar start to switch over and we start to see the eyeballs switch to a, a pretty traditional type of uh, time slot, it proves that the content is getting there if it's not already there. And it really is not about the medium. It's about the content and the quality of the content and the conversation with the audience. All right. Uh, we got a few more stories outside of Internet Week. Uh, Dan, do you mind hanging around and, and chatting with them uh, for the rest of the show? Be my pleasure. Excellent. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks with more than 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. And you, you very special person, as a listener of Tech News Today, get a free audiobook if you give Audible a try at audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. And if you need an idea, uh, we just had Tony Shea on Twit. Uh, recently, uh, he he was on uh, which which show? He was Night on Night at Night, right? 
Yeah, and uh, his book, Delivering Happiness, uh, talks about his very unique and what I think is very admirable way of leading a company. Zappos. Um, just, you know, a, a pretty neat business story. This book is just coming out. It's already available on Audible. And, uh, you know, I think the, the other interesting thing about Audible, my mom, I just bought uh, The Namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri, and it's all about uh, second-generation, first-generation uh, immigrants. And what I the reason she wanted to listen to it is because all the pronunciation was correct. Oh, yeah. And it's for her book club. So she's going to be the only one there who actually knows how to correctly pronounce all of the names of the people in the book. So whether you want Delivering Happiness or any other book that's available in Audible, uh, you can get it for free by trying it out at audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. Let's move on to Skype. Uh, there, there was a rumor out earlier today that Skype was going to use FaceTime on the iPhone when the iPhone, o or I'm sorry, iOS 4 came out. Uh, and Skype has rushed to say, not exactly. Yeah, I was actually really surprised at the keynote that Steve didn't demonstrate Skype built in already, having the APIs already opened up for someone like Skype so that you could go phone to computer while in a Wi-Fi hotspot. So I was surprised that didn't happen off the top. So when this rumor came out, it made sense to me. But then Skype starts backing away from it. I called Skype, and here's the statement that they gave, which is really um, politico, if you ask me. We are glad to see that Apple recognizes the value and potential of mobile video, something we're already delivering to the market on the Nokia and 900, blah, blah, blah. We intend to set the bar on mobile video calling and look forward to working with Apple to bring the best possible mobile video calling experience to blah, 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 blah. They said nothing. And I pushed really hard, but I think the point is they're nervous about how this is all going to play out and what Apple will allow them to do yeah. with the FaceTime interface. They are, they're hoping, they don't want to use the FaceTime protocol because they already have their own way of delivering video and they don't, they don't want to have to go into the cost of re-engineering and using that protocol, even though it's open. It's also phone to phone. They want it to go Skype to Skype, right? Or they want it to go phone to computer. Or, or yeah, anybody with a Skype account on whatever device should be able to get their video call. So they want to convince Apple to let them do that. And I'm sure they're living in fear that with FaceTime, Apple's just going to say, nope, nothing, nothing else gets on there except us. Yeah, and then it, it, you also bring in all these other questions. So can the Skype API access the front-facing camera so that it just lives within Skype? Hard to know. Does FaceTime get uh, an add-on, which is use, call a Skype number or a Skype person? So there's all these delicate um, negotiations that you can see them headed towards with Apple. Major carriers uh, and Google and even Microsoft are getting together to form a self-regulatory technical advisory group. It's called BITAG or BITAG or BITAG. I saw it as BITTAG because I think they're saying it's about tagging bits for priority. Broadband Internet Technical Advisory Group. Bite me. I mean, bit, bit uh, anyway, it will serve as an industry driven forum to develop consensus on broadband network management practices. I think the idea here is to get the engineers together who are actually the ones who know what kind of network management needs to happen. That is sometimes not exactly neutral, but needs to happen to make networks work. Uh, so it's the folks on the net neutrality side like Google, Microsoft, Intel, uh, and, and the folks on the anti-net neutrality side, Verizon, Comcast, AT&T, all together in one advisory group. Sounds like a good idea to me. And I think the really good point is that this has become a very polarizing issue and, and, and the sides are pulling further and further away from each other. And so instead of hashing it out with, you know, aggressive discourse or, you know, missives back and forth, why not just break it down to the technical aspects and make some, you know, advice, advisory statements, and then back it out afterwards. Instead of getting it heated up, let's cool it down with some facts. And when I think, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Well, I think we'll we'll wait to see uh, how neutral this can be, but I think that this really could serve the purpose of, uh, say, an ombudsman uh, that that could really oversee and help, like Becky said, break down uh, the communication problems that these ironically, that these communications companies have, have had. And some type of neutral third party or third group really can add to the, not just 
the ability of them to function, but to their credibility with consumers as well. Well, you've got a good creative tension, right? You've got uh, the content creators uh, represented by Google and Microsoft, uh, and you've got the ISPs. What, what you are missing here is the users. And Google has actually said on their own that they are open to bringing in some representative of the users into this discussion. That was my mic, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> some representative of uh, users into this discussion. Uh, so how would that work? Who would you get? Who gets to represent us on this thing? Well, this is, again, whenever you, you have these kind of big issues and you let the geeks figure it out, the major problem you have is then the, inma the inmates are running the asylum. So, we, it, Tom, I nominate you. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't got time. <laughs> uh, is, is there, Dan, can you think of a, of a consumer group or an advocacy group that would be adequate to that task? You know, I can't. And my immediate jump would be to say, well, how about the EFF or, or a, a similar organization? I know. I oh, ah, we lost his audio. We lost your audio, Dan. They're trying to silence you. The net is not neutral about Dan Patterson. He's been he's been shut down. You <laughs> know, what, I'm going to call I'm going to call Consumer Reports and get them right on this. Yeah, I get, could be EFF, yeah. could be the open uh, oh, open source initiative. Maybe I don't know. I'm just thinking off the top of my head but yeah I, I Free, uh, freepress.net pointed out that they think it should be the FCC they think that that's the point of a government agency is to be is to work for the public interest um, and I wanted to ask you guys do you think that this represents a distrust by uh, both sides of the net neutrality debate for and against a distrust of the FCC to do the to know what to do I think it's a wanting to avoid self uh, wanting to avoid government regulation it, it's an it, no matter what they say about no this isn't going to be a re self regulatory agency we're not trying to preempt the FCC they are trying to stave off over regulation and they want to come up with something that they can hand to the FCC and say look we all agree on this so if you implement it this way you'll keep everybody happy and the FCC is going to want that because they are getting batted around on this issue quite a bit um, I've reached my net neutrality max. <laughs> you smell smoke; it's coming out of my ears. Let's <laughs> move on to uh, let's move on to some math then. Oh, yeah, Dan is math. totally left. Look at that. <laughs> See, he got net neutrality. There's just some too. empty microphone. <laughs> uh, we, we'll try to get Dan's audio back and get it back on. But first, uh, Dr. Raymond Sonera, who runs DisplayMate Technologies, uh, talked to Jason Cross at PC World about the Retina display. Now, the idea with the Retina display on the iPhone is that it is the same resolution that our eyes can see it's higher so if, so if it was any higher it wouldn't make a difference because our eyes couldn't tell the difference anyway now steve jobs said what that it was 318 let him, or something? let him say yeah, it well, yeah. Well, well check this out first so he's actually got a screenshot for those who, who can't see this on the video that says uh 300 is limit of human retina and and tom what did this uh what did the pc magazine contributor say is the limit of the human retina uh, well, we'll get to that. I want to. I want to hear. Okay. I want to hear what Steve yeah, had have, to say. First. Okay. So here's the audio. This is what Steve said. It turns out that there's a magic number right around 300 pixels per inch that when you hold something around 10 or 12 inches away from your eyes is the limit of the human retina to differentiate the pixels. Now, this Dr. Raymond Soner in the PC World article says no. Resolution of the retina is an angular measure. It's 50 cycles per degree. It ends up being about two pixels. So the angular resolution of the eye is 0.6 arc minutes per pixel. Of course, everybody knows that. Becky did the math in her head <laughs> and, uh, and found out that if you hold the iPhone at your typical 12 inches from your eyes, that works out to 477 pixels per inch, not 300. And so at 326, the iPhone at 12 inches is not retina according to this guy sub retinal display and it also depends on how far you uh you hold it right you hold it closer it becomes 716 right if and that's you his hold point. it farther it's, out it's 318 it's a it's a relative measurement it sounds like there's some math issues this will be one of those things that i hold out for my kids as to why math is important <laughs> right um and you know, this is always an interesting thing. When you come down to displays, you have all these issues about what can the human eye discern. And I still think this about things like uh, the difference between, I don't know, um, 1080i and 1080p. You know, I can't tell the difference. My eyes, I can't see it, especially well, the further away you get. And that's the that's the exact question. Dan, do we have you back? Hey. Oh, uh, yeah. There. 
So, so do you think it makes a a, a difference if if this math is right or not? If if the screen looks great, I don't think it makes a difference at all. I I mean, yes, people want to get up in arms about Steve Jobs, but look, I've worked in recording studios and radio studios for a long time. In fact, right up the street from you in uh, Katadi, I worked at Tom Waits Studio, and one of the lessons I took away from there is you can the gear can be pristine, but through normal everyday living. The damage that I've done to my ears, it doesn't matter how good that that potentially can sound. It really just matters what my ears do here. And the same thing here. I, I mean, whether Jobs was, was deceiving or not, I'm, I'm really not that interested. But what is important is what I can see and what I can experience. And in this case, uh, it sounds like it's brilliant. Yeah, I, I guess it, it matters in a marketing sense of what you should correctly be able to say or not say. But Well, and that's the thing, quantifying resolution quantifying display is very difficult so when you're reading specs and the way that it plays out when you're looking at something on the web it's like you need some quantitative analysis i looked at the new iphone 4 screen it's drop dead gorgeous when steve was trying to show it in the keynote i couldn't tell a bit of difference what was what was better and what was worse yeah but in real life the text is so fluid there's no jaggy no pixelation it's pretty sweet maybe steve jobs just has long arms somebody in the chat room suggested that Hey, what Steve's long arms is his business. New Google search index is 50% fresher with caffeine. That's the uh, slash dot headline on this. Uh, they say when Google started, it only updated its index every four months, uh, and it started indexing its month in a, or every month in a process called the Google Dance that took a week to ten days. Now, PC World reporting that Google has introduced a new web indexing system called Caffeine, which delivers results that are closer to live not just for Twitter or Facebook, for the whole web by analyzing the web in small portions and then updating the index on a continuous basis. Caffeine takes up nearly 100 million gigabytes of storage in one database and adds new information at a rate of hundreds of thousands of gigabytes per day. Faster, better, fresher, newer. Bigger. And it's going to become self-aware at this rate. <laughs> Yeah. 50% well, fresher than Google's last index, uh, but the new search index provides a robust foundation that will make it possible for Google to build a faster and more comprehensive search engine, which, of course, they need to do because there's Bing. Right. Competition, more, make money. Good. Bigger, faster, stronger. Portal 2. Uh, did you ever play Portal, Dan? Uh, I, I've i never owned a console. I'm not opposed to uh You to can video play games, it on the PC, but, you know. Well... The PC. Hmm. Interesting. No, <laughs> I, I, I did not, but uh, I've spent many hours watching friends play. Uh, Portal is a fantastic game, as many in the audience know. It has given rise to one of the greatest songs on the internet still alive. And so everyone's very excited about Portal 2, uh, which is now going to be delayed. We're not going to get it by Christmas. And the best part about this is Valve's press release, which said, Valve announces making games is hard. Uh, they also said, even though Portal 2 will arrive slightly later than planned, all life on Earth won't instantaneously stop as every molecule in your body explodes at the speed of light. <laughs> I should say that song, and Colton is is uh, a Brooklynite and uh, a, a reasonably large part of the New York internet and tech community out here. And uh, the song, I think, actually really does... I don't know the game, Tom, but I definitely know the song. I hear it everywhere. I hear the video game version, and I hear his version. I think it's a great example of how games are not just in the realm of games. I don't, I'm not a huge gamer myself, but crossing that, that cultural boundary and becoming something that is a far more legitimate art form uh, is... Portal might be one of the best illustrations of that. Uh, and we will be covering E3 next week. Uh, Eric is going down there along with Leo and Brian Brushwood, and uh, they'll be streaming live Monday and Tuesday, right, mm -hmm. from E3. So check that out at live.twit.tv. And uh, you might hear a little bit about the announcement because there's a surprise announcement around Portal 2. I know Jonathan Colton's working on a song for them. Uh, I wonder if it's for Portal 2. Oh, that's great. Now, do, do you not play so many console games because you're afraid of becoming violent, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been violent for years, Tom. Uh, no, in fact, I've never owned a television. Uh, I own a big uh, monitor, but I've never owned a television. However, it's not the games. It's the medium and the platform. And now with the iPad, my God, 
now I'm I'm a gamer and I'm very excited about that. See, now we need to worry about him becoming violent. Well, we're, we're not sure yet. Uh, a special issue of the journal Review of General Psychology published a study in June by the American Psychological Association researchers saying that not everyone gets aggressive when they play violent video games. It's only a certain personality type, a certain combination of personality traits that predicted which young people were more adversely affected by violent video games. Like? Uh, who are Traits for children who are most likely to become hostile uh, are people with high neuroticism, meaning they're easily angried. Uh, angried. They're, they're easily angry. angried. <laughs> uh, they don't use English too well. <laughs> it's you! Uh, easily upset, angry, depressed, emotional. Uh, low agreeableness, little concern for others, indifferent of others' feelings, and low conscientiousness. They break rules, don't keep promises. You get those three in high enough levels together, and the violent video games makes them violent. It sounds like they start out as an a-hole. Yeah. Basically, the jerks get jerkier. Shocker. Uh, each participant played a violent or non-violent video game, and they found out that teenagers who were highly neurotic, less agreeable, and less conscientious tended to be the most adversely affected, whereas participants who did not possess these personality characteristics were either unaffected or only slightly negatively affected. Unfortunately, when you put the word teenager in front of it, that describes all teenagers. Well, I think there is a baseline, and they, they, okay. they're like, even for a teenager, <laughs> you know, they... So this will be some new uh, test that you take. Uh, you know, your guidance counselor gives it to you and sends the results home to mom and dad and says... Like, no Grand Theft Auto for you, son. Nope. Not till you become more agreeable. That's right. <laughs> um, I have some interesting calendar items coming up. And the one came out of the chat room just a second ago. This is a really interesting rumor. June 19th at T-Mobile, all phones free. All with contract. With contract. But right. we're talking about MyTouch 3G Slide, um, Nexus One, a bunch of phones. I mean, that would be huge for the Sidekick fans. That would be epic. Yeah. If this is true, now this is purely a rumor, that would be pretty epic. So I'm going to start making some phone calls, but that's a rumor. If you're basically, this is a good enough rumor that if you're a T-Mobile subscriber and you're thinking about upgrading, just black out the 19th and we'll find out what the deal is. Um, another thing coming up is Father's Day. Mm -hmm. Everybody just heads up. It's June 20th. Um, I am doing a Good Morning America segment for Geeky Dads. So anybody who has gift ideas, send them to me. Uh, be Whirly on Twitter. And then I have this to show you, Tom. This is the Hammaker Schlemmer catalog, mm -hmm. which A, I'm proud I can say. Hammaker Schlemmer has become the new easy, sharper image. Easy for you to say. Well, because there's no more sharper image. I know. But do you see this? I'm holding up a picture of this thing that looks like an egg on a pedestal. Yes. And I saw this at, C at uh, CES and thought it was the dumbest invention ever. It's like a sonic immersion chair. So you get incredible quality of music when you're listening to it. Right, because it's got all that soundproofing stuff inside the chair. And it's a piece of furniture. I thought this is the dumbest thing ever. And then it ends up on the cover of Hamaker Schlemmer magazine as the Father's Day gift of the year. I call that's bonk. But you know, I, I'm just I bought the progressive wake up alarm clock from Hamaker Schlemmer and was very disappointed with it. Oh, I'm sorry. Because it, it, it was not progressive or very gentle in its oh. waking up. You wake up grumpy. <laughs> See, you're that violent gamer Stink guy. Yeah, it turns you into that violent gamer guy. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get to the email, or I'm oh, sorry, voicemails, 260-TNT-SHOW is the place you can call. Uh, we have an anonymous caller uh, who has a question about the logo art for Tech News today. Hey, host, and more importantly, TNT fans, this is Snit. These kind of weird economic times, I have to admit something's troubling me. Probably you too. I suspect the Twit Mothership spent a significant amount of time and money developing the TNT Tom Merritt cartoon avatar thingy that was basically out of date before it was even released. I think it's a job of anyone listening that has Photoshop skills to transpose Merritt's face with that of a marmot in order to better reflect the new reality. <laughs> it's time to crowdsource Tom's face. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So I see this is um, layer one, Tom's face. Layer two, marmot. marmot. Uh, there have been a few people who have actually created new uh, album art for TNT nice. uh, with, with a, a, an attempt at putting a beard. In there. I, well, I'm just not sure. I don't want to make them come up with a new with new art here when when I might shave it off any just day. Need now. the sharpie do it, approach. No, you you've carried the beard off for a long time. You think you you think I should keep it? 
I think you should absolutely keep it. I mean, it's a, a new chapter, a new era, and what represents uh, more manliness than a beard? I know that because I listen to the Stuff You Should Know podcast, who are also here for Internet Week. Excellent. Stuff. I will uh, hit you up for beard tips after the show then. That sounds exciting. Let's move on to the emails to TNT at twit.tv. That's the email address if you think, why? how would I send you an email? That's where you send it, TNT at twit.tv. Peter on the Big Island. Uh, wrote in. That is Hawaii. Oh, no. Becky's got a great solution there with her baby powder. This was regarding uh, uh, using uh, the touch screen on the iPad. Yeah, it I gives also, you more mobility. I also find that after I've cleaned my hands with a good alcohol-based hand sanitizer, the responsiveness on the capacitive devices really increases. It also helps with the uh, sanitation issue. <laughs> Aloha, Peter. Mahalo, Peter. Thanks for your, uh, your tip. I would think that it would make it harder to use the touch screen because you get dry but I'm, I'm gonna try it no it's it's moisture that is your enemy that creates stickies on the touch screen and mm. so peter he's probably from helo side which is very moist right moist obviously a lot of people not hate a that kona word. side he's not a kona side yeah. guy hey that bugger live over helo side that's why yeah a guy is sucking on rain every time you never knew i could talk pigeon eh yeah i did okay but i'm glad i got you to do it <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we got another email about all the questions about the gyroscope in the iPhone 4. Um, basically, we were talking, someone uh, called or emailed in and asked if the gyroscope could be used for image stabilization in the camera. And my postulation was that it's not the same kind of gyroscope that does um, counterbalancing used in cameras. Um, and I got a ton of email and lots of folks via Twitter um, and this one was really good from Joe Wilson. He says, uh, the answer to your question about the gyroscope in the eye bone is that there's a 99% chance it's not going to stabilize pics. Um, and everyone else who wrote in saying, basically, this is something for motion control, incredible gesture control. And there's a great video on YouTube showing an add-on gyroscope to a Nexus One, I think it is. It's one of the Android phones. And it's amazing the things that they've got this thing doing via gesture. It's very cool. The uh, Matt, the safety engineer, wrote, wrote in with a detailed explanation of it, saying that an electrical gyroscope doesn't keep the phone from tipping over. It's not a physical gyroscope, but it can measure the rotation of the phone in space without getting overly technical, although this is pretty technical. Uh, there are angular rate sensing chips that can detect the angular velocity being imparted to the phone as you, as you move it around. So the sensing mechanism in the chip will change the resistance seen by the connected circuit and that change can be translated in the phone's angular velocity. So you have six motion axis detection because you have the ability to detect the acceleration linearly, right? And the angular velocity, the rotational motion, along three axes each. So you get six. Um, this is a classic, this just in. I Dane. saw Dane, Dane, <laughs> Danger Dane ran in with, a, uh, with breaking news. Handed me a piece of paper, this just in. Uh, and this is from Apple Insider. Basically, AT&T website hack has leaked, uh, an AT&T website hack has leaked iPad 3G user emails. Black Hat hackers have exploited a security flaw on AT&T's web servers, and they've obtained the email addresses from the SIM cards of iPad 3G users. And I think these are iPad 3G early adopters. Yeah. Folks who were got, given an iPad 3G early. So, so uh, New York Times CEO Janet Robinson Diane Sawyer of ABC News, film mogul Harvey Weinstein, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel, all their information was compromised. Whoops. Uh, Whoops. Vulnerable to spam marketing, malicious hacking, and it's, it says that the hackers are coy about what they're going to do with the information. All right. So uh, anyway, that's, that's bad news. We'll, we'll try to dig into this and, and give you a few more details on tomorrow's tech news today. But, Tomorrow's uh, tech news today. Yeah. Yes. Tech new, uh, today's tech news tomorrow. <laughs> Wait. Dan Patterson, save us. Thank you so much uh, for being on the show. It was great talking with you again. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Let people know where they can find more of you on the internet or radio or wherever. Uh, well, we're building some uh, new sites that will be on uh, abcnewsradio.com in just a little bit. But I'm at Dan Patterson on Twitter and just danpatterson.com. All right. And that's it for Tech News Today. You can get in touch with us by emailing us, tnt at twit.tv or calling 260-TNT-SHOW. Thanks to Becky Worley and Eric Lanigan for riding along with me. Thanks to Leo for letting us on the network. And thanks to you for watching. We'll see you next time.